Welcome back students. In this video segment we will cover section 6.2 star or asterisk, the natural logarithm. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Um, in our uh, introductory section, section for this course, section 6.1 or just before it, I, um, I mentioned that this course, in this course we spend a lot of time uh, filling in the missing mathematics that you're going to need, specifically the missing calculus that you're going to need for STEM course, for STEM majors. Uh, specifically, a lot of students take this, who take this course are engineering majors. And what I did was I used a kind of a strange analogy that I'm going to continue with. I, say, I said that um, if, um, if a slice of cheese represents the, the mathematics that's necessary for the sciences, the calculus that's necessary for science, for STEM courses or STEM majors, then Calc 1 is a slice of Swiss cheese. And then I said uh, Swiss cheese has the characteristic of having holes in it. And those holes are the gaps in the mathematics that, that are in Calculus 1. So here's that slice of cheese. <laughs> so here's a slice of cheese uh, from that represents uh, the, the calculus that you took in math in uh, Calc one, and it's full of holes. So what are those? What are those holes? And uh, and how are we going to go about filling those holes in so that we get a more solid? slice of cheese for for uh, the STEM majors. Well, here's, uh, I'll, I'll loosen up with this, this analogy real soon, but one of the big holes contains this little integral right here. And I mentioned this in our, again, I mentioned this in our introductory video, the integral of um, 1 over x with respect to x. Um, we can't use a power rule on this. The power rule breaks down. The power rule, the, the big rule for the, the real big rule for uh, integration in Calc 1 said the, the antiderivative of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant as long as that exponent is not negative 1. If uh, the exponent is negative 1, that uh, rule breaks down. That rule would say if this were, if n equals negative 1 were allowed, that we would have x to the negative 1 plus 1 over negative 1 plus 1 plus a constant, which is x to the 0 over 0 plus a constant, and that's impossible. You can't divide by 0. This is impossible. So this is not how we're going to be able to find the antiderivative, the most general antiderivative of 1 over x. But we need that antiderivative. This, this fun, the function one over x, occurs uh, very frequently in STEM math, in, in science math. So we need this antiderivative. In fact, the, I think that that hole in the Swiss cheese is probably the biggest one. <clears throat> other, other holes in the Swiss cheese had things like uh, the integral of two to the x, the integral of a of a um, an exponential function. Uh, we can't do that using Calc 1, and there are others. So we, I think I mentioned in, in our introductory video the integral of the inverse sine. That's a big one of x. We can't do that. So um, let's aim for filling in this first and biggest Swiss cheese hole <laughs> today, or in this video segment. Okay, we want to address how we deal with the an the antiderivative of one over x. To the, to do that, we're going to introduce a new function in a in probably a very strange way for you. The function is not new to you. You studied this kind of function in um, precalculus, but we didn't define this function this way in precalculus. The function is called the natural logarithm natural logarithm logarithm and it's abbreviated l n x okay i wrote in cursive uh, l n x because if you write it using printing it looks like 1 n x or i n x um, mostly 
I like to write in printing. So when I, if I write, uh, if I'm talking about the natural logarithm function, don't interpret it as INX. I'm not familiar with any function INX or 1NX. It's LNX. Okay, so the natural logarithm function LNX <coughs> is defined as, and here's where it gets a little strange for, for non-calculus students, is defined as the integral from 1 to X of 1 over T dt and this is only true for allowed for x greater than zero. This is the definition of the natural logarithm. It looks very different from the, the logarithm definition that you studied in pre-calc or in or intermediate algebra, but it turns out that this function does in fact behave like a logarithm. And a lot of what I'm gonna do do in this video segment is to to show you that that this behaves just like a logarithm. Okay, so let's um let's um interpret the definition of the logarithm using uh, some ideas from from Calc one. In Calc one, the primary or first definition of the logarithm <clears throat> was that of defining area underneath the curve. So let's um let's take a look let's take a close look at this definition from natural logarithm and interpret it as area so let's um let's take a look at graphing the integrand y equals one over t so this is y versus t and here's a, an approximate graph of y equals one over t and let's put x equals 1 here. <clears throat> and then let's, uh, let's put another value for t. Like I said, x equals 1. t equals 1. Then let's put another value for t. Let's say t equals x. We'll start with x slightly to the right of 1. And if I consider that little chunk of area between 1 and x, and we learned in Calc 1 that since the function 1 over t is non-negative, since it lies above the t-axis, then the definite integral gives you area. So if x is greater than 1, then the natural log of x, which is the integral from 1 to x uh, of 1 over t dt, is simply the uh, interpreted as the area underneath the, the curve from, from 1 to x. It's the area under y equals 1 over t, actually not 1 over x, 1 over t, from the lower limit of integration, up 1, to the upper limit of integration, the variable x. Okay, and that's positive. So if x is more than 1, the natural log of x, which is interpreted as area, is greater than 0. Okay, so if, if x is, let's say, less than 1, if x is less than 1, but x can't, oops, not less than 0, less than 1. If x is less than 1, but remember the definition of the logarithm is that x has to be greater than 0. So if x is, oh, this is real strange here, I've got two ifs. <laughs> Let's see, let me get rid of one of those ifs. If x is between 0 and 1, <clears throat> then the uh, natural logarithm of x it doesn't the the definition doesn't change just because we let x be somewhere between 0 and 1 it's still the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt but let's take a look at the graph of where of what area we're looking at i'm going to switch to say let's say green i'm going to put x between 0 and 1 somewhere if x is between 0 and 1, then I'm still integrating from 1 to x, but I'm integrating from right to left. And the, the, the definite and integral interpretation of area insists that the lower limit of integration 
must be less than the upper limit of regression. I have that reversed. So I'm going to use a property from Calc 1 to make things work out. I'm going to switch the limits of integration. So it's now from x to 1. Now it's going from, from a lower limit to upper limit. Remember, x is now between 0 and 1. Uh, but when you switch the limits of integration, you introduce a minus sign into the integral. Okay. Now, the integral from x to 1, the integral from x to 1 without the minus sign, the integral from x to 1 of 1 over x dx. Let me make a little thicker ink on this pen here. Is equal to the area under the curve from x to 1. But the natural log is the opposite of that. So it's equal to the opposite of the area under uh, y equals 1 over t from x to 1. OK, so if x is between 0 and 1, the natural log of x will be negative. OK? All right. So I'll summarize what I just said there. Uh, if x is greater than 1, the natural log of x is area. So it's greater than 0. It's positive. So if x is between 0 and 1, then the natural log of x is negative. Okay, this may not seem real significant to you, but this is exactly how logarithms behave. So my, my goal, my, uh, one of my big goals in this section I, uh, to, to reiterate is to convince you that this, this, um, this definition for the natural logarithm is in fact uh, a definition of a logarithm. It behaves like logarithms should. So um, it, this, is, this, is, uh, this is how logarithms should, should happen. If x is more than 1, a logarithm is positive. If x is less than between 0 and 1, a log is negative. I'll, I'll, I'll um, review with you this, that concept, general, uh, general concept with logarithms and logarithms in a, sec, a few seconds. Um, for right now, I want to look at some properties of this, um, this new function, this natural logarithm function. Okay. First, let's take a look at the natural logarithm of 1. Okay, see if, you can, see if you can remember as I'm going through this the properties of, of logarithms that you learned in, in pre-calculus. It's been a little while probably since you've seen them, but this will be real helpful to you to um, uh, review the, the logarithms. Logarithms are, are going to come back in kind of a big way in this course. So the logarithm of 1 is the integral from 1 to 1 of 1 over t dt. Okay, remember the definition of the of the logarithm, the natural logarithm, back up on the page here. Let's see, I think I'll highlight it in, the, in red here for us just temporarily. There's the definition of the natural natural logarithm. Okay, it's the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. So if I substitute x equals 1, that means I put 1 in the upper limit of integration. And if you integrate from 1 to 1, we know that that give, always gives us 0. It always gives us 0. It's like, it's like saying, what's the area when you start it at a equals 1 and end at b equals 1? The area under a single point is nothing. There is no area underneath a single point. And that's, a, that's an important property that says the natural logarithm of 1 is 0. The natural logarithm of 1 is 0. That's how logarithms behave. Log, any logarithm of 1 is 0. Now, let's, uh, let's study or let's take a look at a, a calculus property of, of the natural logarithm. Uh, for you, calculus is generally involves one of three things, either limits, derivatives, or integrals. So let's take a look at the, the derivative of the natural logarithm function. In order to take the derivative of the natural logarithm function, we're going to need to review something very important from Calc 1. At this point, I, I very often ask my class uh, as a whole to, to answer the question or consider answer, answering the question, uh, what's the most important thing you learned in Calc 1? Because that's really 
subject to opinion, but there's there's something that does stand out. What is singly the most important, if you had to have one thing, what is that, the most important thing in Calc 1? And very, uh, very rarely do does do students come up with the answer and it's hard you can't really blame the students there you usually your uh, students are not concentrating on on identifying what is the most important thing but how do you use derivatives limits and integrals well the most important thing to cut to the chase in calc 1 it's called the fundamental theorem of calculus it's the relationship between uh, derivatives and integrals and the, the relationship between area and anti-differentiation. So the, the fundamental theorem of calculus, just to remind you, let's put this in like green to remind us here. Let's say the fundamental theorem of calculus, fundamental theorem of calculus has two parts actually. We'll just look at the first part. Okay, let's do this, part one says that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x of g of t dt is g of x. In, uh, in Calc 1, the second part was uh, of the fundamental theorem was the one you used mostly. It, that was the, the part that says if, if you want to if you want to evaluate a definite integral, you don't have to use Riemann sums and that that uh, that very difficult uh, limit definition of the of the integral. You simply um, and sometimes not so simply, you simply find an antiderivative and then substitute upper and lower limits of integration and subtract. But this was the first part. It says essentially that the derivatives and integrals cancel each other out. Okay, as long as the lower limit of integration is constant and the upper limit of integration is the variable uh, x, then, then uh, derivatives and integrals cancel each other out. Okay, so I want to find the derivative of the natural logarithmic function. So the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x is the derivative with respect to x. Well, the definition of the natural logarithm is the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. Okay, and this is very simply simple now because we have the fundamental theorem right above. We simply take the upper limit of integration, stuff it into the function, and get rid of the derivative and integral. The derivative of the natural logarithm x is 1 over x. This is huge for us. This is huge, huge, huge for us. So let me, uh, to make it look huge on your screen here, let me ch change it to red. Let me change it to red in a, there. The derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. This is extremely important. What we just did with this, oops, it went back to black. I want it red. Let's see. Um, bear with me for a second. There we are. I think that should do it. Good. Okay. So, um, what we did now is probably getting tired of that cheese analogy. But we, what we just did now, there's the big, the big. A hole in the cheese that represented the integral of 1 over x. We just did this. We just filled in this portion. I guess I could use a thicker pen, ink pen here to do this. That's all right. I got a little time on my hands here. This is what we did with that big hole. We left a little sliver of that big hole. It's not quite enough. It's not quite enough. But the derivative of the natural log of the max is 1 over x. You can kind of see why, why that fills in the hole so much. If the derivative of ln x is 1 over x, that means the antiderivative of 1 over x should involve the natural log of this. Looks like we've, we've almost answered or, or filled in that big hole. Not quite, not quite. Um, we'll, we'll see exactly how what we need to do to finish that in oh, about 10 or 15 minutes or so. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at 
some properties of the natural logarithm. Sorry about that technical glitch there. I'm back. Let's take a look at some properties of the natural logarithm function. You might not directly remember, but when you studied logarithms in pre-calc or in intermediate algebra, there were three really big properties satisfied by logarithms. See if you can try to remember what those things are. Oh, I'll give you a hint and then we'll go directly to them. Logarithms turn multiplication into what? Logarithms turn multiplication into addition. Logarithms turn divi division into subtraction. Logarithms turn division into subtraction. And there's a third one. So let's take a look. And there's also a third one. So let's take a look at, what, at the properties, the corresponding properties of logarithms, natural logarithms. So one, the natural logarithm of xy is the natural logarithm of x plus the natural logarithm of y. Logarithm, natural logarithms turn a multiplication into addition, just like uh, logarithms, general logarithms in, in algebra turn multiplication into, into addition. So two, natural logarithms turn division into subtraction. The logarithm turns fractions into subtraction. The logarithm turns division into subtraction. And the, the third of the big three is also, which is also satisfied by the natural logarithm, is that the logarithms turn, let's see if you can come up with the right word for this. I usually ask this question in class, and, and once in a blue moon I have a, a student or two coming up with the right word. If logarithms turn multiplication, x times y, into addition, log of x plus log of y, and logarithms turn division into subtraction, then what do logarithms turn exponents into? I want one word. One word. Can you come? Can you think of it? One word. I'll give you a hint if you, if you didn't think of it. Logarithms turn exponents into a word that starts with C. Did you think of it? Well, into coefficients. So the logarithm of x to the r is equal to r times the natural logarithm of x. This natural logarithm defined by the integral behaves just like the natural logarithms that, that or not sorry, not the natural logarithms, but the, the, the general logarithms that you studied in algebra. And we're going to see much more of that very, very soon. We're going to make, we're going to basically, we're going to force this natural logarithm to, to look just like a regular logarithm. Okay. So in the, um, in the, for, in the next, for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, what I'm going to do is go through with you how to get an, an idea of what the graph of the natural logarithm func function looks like. What do we expect it to look like? We expect it to look just like a logarithm that you studied in previous algebra courses. So let me, uh, let me remind you first of uh, a few things that we learned in, in algebra, or a few things that you guys learned in algebra about logarithms. So this is a reminder, a reminder from pre-calc. Calculus about logarithms. So uh, if we let y equal the logarithm to base b of x, then we learned in algebra that the graph of this function, the graph of this function, oops, is always something that looks like this as long as the base is more than one the natural or the the logarithm function always goes through the point one zero the logarithm function is uh, always has a vertical asymptote of the y-axis okay 
um, there is uh, one point there is one point on the x-axis where the logarithm always equals one the lo not zero the log of one is zero yeah the log of the logarithm to base b of one is zero but there's one point where the y value is always one and that's the actual base itself the logarithm uh, to base b of b is always equal to one okay uh, other things that are satisfied are that the the logarithm to base b of x uh, becomes infinite so approaches infinity as x approaches infinity the logarithm i already mentioned has a vertical asymptote what does that mean the logarithm base b of x approaches negative infinity as x creeps closer and closer to zero from the right hand side okay these are these are all properties that we looked at in in calc and, and pre-calculus and you know we studied logarithms when we studied logarithms although we may not have used the the limit concepts of uh, ver vertical asymptotes and so forth we, we generally got the same same type thing okay so I want I want to look at the graph of I want to graph the natural logarithm function, but I don't want to I don't want to assume that it has the graph of a logarithm. I want to get there. I want to prove it. You're going to be doing some heavy duty graphing in this course, um, as you'll see when you look at uh, homework problems. I think starting in 6.2, it might be 6.3. Um, so this is a good review for us. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's go back to our calculus. Let's get out of green. The green stuff is pre is pre calc. So back to uh, calculus. Let's let's look at graphing the logarithm function. Y equals the natural log of x. Remember, the natural log of x has this very bizarre definition. It's the integral of one over x. To, uh, sorry, the integral from one to x of one over t dt, as long as uh, x is greater than zero. So the domain. The domain is is uh, positive values for x. So uh, let's see that this is exactly the graph of this function is exactly a logarithm function like the, the log in green the log function in green graphed above. Well, what do we do when we're graphing functions? We typically want to identify a lot of stuff. The domain. Well, the domain is uh, x is between zero and infinity. How do I know that? That's the def. This is from the definition of the of the natural logarithm. Okay, and coincidentally, look at the green graph. The domain of the general logarithm function is x is between zero and infinity. Okay, so so far this thing is behaving like a logarithm. Okay, we just saw that the natural log of one was zero. Um, a few seconds ago, the integral from 1 to 1, 1 over t dt, 0. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly how a logarithm should behave. The logarithm of 1 is 0. Okay, so this thing is behaving more and more like a logarithm. Let's take a look at um, getting the natural logarithm to to approach infinity this guy over here let's do let's see if we can get the corresponding uh feature in red that is that the the logarithm the logarithm becomes infinite as x approaches infinity let's see if we can do that with the with the natural logarithm this is a little rough this is a little rough it's a little tricky um yeah so um let's see how do we do this let's do this let's let x equal 2 to the n power already this is seeming kind of strange i'm sure to you let's let x equal 2 to the n power so as n gets big 
x gets big and vice versa as x gets big it's re we require a large value for n so the the important thing is is that i want to take the limit as x approaches infinity of the natural log of x and show that it's doing this the thing that we would like it to do the second red arrow i have above in the, in the general logarithm i want x i want this logarithm to go to infinity well, I'm, re I'm substituting for x uh, a new expression, 2 to the n. So this is the limit of the natural logarithm of 2 raised to the n. But as x approaches infinity, n approaches infinity. The exponent should approach infinity. Okay, now let's use that the third of the big prop the big three properties, that little n exponent in 2 to the n can come right down. So this is the limit as n approaches infinity of n times the natural logarithm of 2. Okay, so again I'm referring to by the property 3 above. So that's by property 3 above by property 3 above. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. Well, the natural logarithm of 2, oops, I want to go back to black. The natural logarithm of 2 is approximately 0.7. How do I know that? In my calculator, I pushed ln2. <laughs> so we kind of have to accept a value for the natural log. Log of 2 is about 0.7. So this is approximately the limit uh, 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 as n approaches infinity of n times 0.7. Okay, and this pretty much does it um, for for the limit. Let's take a look at this limit, n times 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is 70 percent. So n times 0.7 is 70 percent of n. 70 percent of n. So as n is get as n gets big, as a number gets big, does 70 percent of a number get big? Yeah. What's uh? If let the let, let n equal a million, what's seventy percent of a million? It's seven hundred thousand. So as n gets big, point se point seven times n gets also big. So this is infinity, and this does it. This says uh, if we if we kind of eliminate the middleman here, this says that the limit as x approaches infinity of the natural log of x is infinity. So that's a big property. That is the property, that, that green property I have the second arrow on. That I put the second arrow on. Log of x goes to infinity. I won't do the uh, vertical asymptote, but it's similar. Um, the, the natural log of x approaches negative infinity as x approaches zero from the right. Uh, I think the textbook shows it if you wanted to see it done. So, um, let's get this shape of the logarithm now the shape what do i mean by the shape look at the look at the green logarithm function i want the, the natural logarithm function to have the same shape i already know that the y values go to infinity as x goes to infinity we're sort of taking it on faith that we have a vertical asymptote how do i get the rest of the shape what do i mean by the rest of the shape think about what we mean by shape the shape of a graph from calc 1 this graph bends down What's another word for bend? What's a better set of words for bending down that we learned in Calc 1? Bending down, but curving downward. It means concave down. So I want to show that this curve is concave down. I want to show what else about this, this curve. Does it ever decrease? No, the, shirt, the curve is always increasing. So I want to show that, that uh, this, this uh, natural logarithm function is doing exactly what the regular uh, old garden variety logarithm that you learned about in algebra is doing. I want to show that it's increasing and concave down. Let's handle increasing. What do, how do we hand, how do we determine if a function is increasing? This was one of the most important things you learned in Calc 1. How is the derivative, the first derivative of a function related to the, the idea of the function increasing? By the first derivative, if the if the derivative if the first derivative is positive, the function is increasing. 
First derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. When the function first derivative is zero, then the function levels off. Okay, so let's find y prime. If if y equals if y equals ln x, we already determined that the derivative is one over x. Now that's telling us not just something about increasing or decreasing is saying is saying quite a bit more okay now remember the definition of a logarithm natural logarithm is only for x greater than zero so this is greater than zero for f for all x in the domain so uh, the natural logarithm rather than natural logarithm x is increasing there's something else that this derivative is telling us though what is the limit as x approaches infinity not of y we already know the limit as x approaches infinity of y is positive infinity we just figured that out in the last uh, property what's the limit as x approaches infinity of the derivative and what does that mean well it means well first of all it is the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x as x gets big 1 over x gets small so this is saying what the derivative is approaching zero the function is increasing but the derivative is approaching zero so natural log of x is leveling off leveling off but never becomes horizontal we would have to have y prime equal to zero and one over x is never equaling zero now there's something very strange going on here when you consider the last property the log of x goes to infinity with the concept of this function leveling off the logarithm the y values on the logarithm function are becoming infinite and we showed that in the last property okay we showed that in the property that i'm identifying with a red arrow now this says that the y values become infinite the y becomes infinite as x approaches infinity what that means is that we do not have a horizontal asymptote the, fun, the y values do not approach a specific number for x as x gets large however the y values are leveling off how is it possible for the y values to become more and more and more horizontal for the graph to become more and more and more and more and more horizontal that means leveling off without us having an asymptote a horizontal asymptote this is a very strange function this function these two properties are exhibiting something about logarithms in general but in particular about the natural logarithm that is that that separates the natural logarithm from uh, all other functions this function uh, becomes infinite but very 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 slowly the larger x gets the more slowly the the y values uh, increase that that's that, that's what the first derivative is telling us however the last thing we looked at was that the logarithm is becoming infinite it takes extremely large values of x to make the the log the y values on the logarithm natural logarithm or any logarithm even remotely large it, 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 it takes huge values of x to get to get just moderately sized y values this is very important for example the natural log of let's say 10 to the 10th power that's the natural that's a big number 10 to the 10th that's 1 followed by 10 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 6, 9, 10. Okay. 3, 6, 9, 10 zeros. Let's see. 100,000. That's the logarithm of 10 billion. The logarithm of 10 billion, that's huge. X is huge, is only 23. Approximately 23.3. I'm just looking at my calculator. 0.03 okay 
um, if I take a, a number that's astronomically bigger than that, like say logarithm of 10 to the 100th, the logarithm of 10 to the 100th power, no, that's too big for my calculator. I'll put in a smaller one. The not, let's say logarithm of 10 to the, I should have done this beforehand, 10 to the 99th. Let's do this. this is the logarithm of 10 to the 99th. 10 to the 99th is 1 followed by 99 zeros. That's enormous, but the y value, if you take the logarithm of that, the y value is uh, approximately, is there are only approximate values, 227.955, etc., etc. It's only about 228. That's not a very big y value for such a huge x value. This function becomes infinite, but extremely slowly. And the bigger x gets, the more slowly the y values increase. If you really think about that, that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. The curve becomes more and more horizontal as x gets big, but never levels off. The y values become infinite. OK. <clears throat> so far, what do we have? In terms of a graph of the of the natural logarithm, we're pretty close to having the the graph of of, um, of what we believe, according to our algebra, to be a logarithm function. Logarithm function. So what we've learned is that log of one is zero. The curve is always. Uh, we haven't learned about the concavity yet. So maybe we should hold off on the graph for just a second. Yeah, I think we'll do that. I was jumping the gun here a little bit. Let's hold off here. Let me, if my calculator, if my surface will let me delete this. There we are. Um, let's take a look at concavity. We know that if y equals the natural logarithm of x, y prime equals 1 over x, concavity is driven by the second derivative. So the second derivative would be negative 1 over x squared. That's less than 0. So ln x is always concave down. Concave down. So now let's put all this together in a graph. You can definitely do that in the graph now. So here's my axes. Here's x Here's y. Concave down, increasing, vertical asymptote, y-axis. Y values become infinite, but the curve becomes more and more and more horizontal. This is what the graph of the natural logarithm function looks like from what we looked at above. So putting all of this information and information together, we get the graph of something that looks exactly like it should. It looks exactly like a logarithm. What you should do with this is remember it. Remember the graph. If, if you don't remember the graphs of logarithms generally, you should definitely memorize the graph of the natural logarithm function. It's going to follow you through your stem mathematics. It's going to follow you through your standard mathematics. The only thing I haven't done here is to identify the base of this logarithm, the base. We've eliminated the base by writing ln x for this logarithm. We've done that before. What other logarithm, for what other logarithm do we not have, do we not write a base? For what other logarithm do we not have a base? See if you can remember that. We not write a base. Every logarithm has a base. It's the logarithm base 10, the common logarithm. The common logarithm is very rarely written with its base. Okay, this, so this is just shorthand notation. We, we do shorthand notation in other areas. If we want the cubed root of 8, we write cube root of 8 is 2. But if we want the square root of 4, we don't write a little 2 in the index uh, area. We just write the radical symbol without the root, without the uh, index. So we do the same thing with the common logarithm, and we do the same thing 
with the natural logarithm. The natural logarithm has a base. The base of that natural logarithm is not a real simple number. In fact, it's not even a rational number. It's not even a fractional fraction number. It is designated by the using a, a, a small letter e. The logarithm base e of x is the natural logarithm of x. If you look back at our graph, look back at the graph of, of logarithms generally. For logarithms generally, back in green, that the base is always that number that when you take the log of the base you get 1. Well, we have the same thing true for the common logarithm, I'm oh, sorry, the natural logarithm. That base is this number e. And the, the natural log of e is 1. So the, the natural logarithm has a base. Every logarithm has a base. And that base is this very strange but very commonly occurring number in STEM math. It's called e. So where e is an irrational number. If you forgot what irrational numbers are, they just it's just numbers that cannot be written as a decimal that either terminates ends or repeats over and over and over like 0 0.1 1 1 1 1 1 or whatever so where e is approximately equal to 2.718281828446 and that's all i've got memorized it's like pi it goes on forever and ever and ever and never repeats a pattern okay so you ought to memorize that that e is approximately 2.7 or 2.72. You ought to know that. That's a that's a good number to remember. Okay. Okay. So now let's let's do some do some calculus with this natural logarithm function. What do we do? What do we do in calculus? Two main things. We differentiate. We find derivatives, and we integrate. So let's um let's practice with some derivatives using the natural logarithm function. So, for example, let's differentiate. Let's differentiate. Let's find the derivatives of some functions. Suppose we want to find the derivative of the natural log of 3x. Natural log of 3x. Okay. It's not difficult. We know that the derivative, we know that the derivative of the natural logarithm function. It's just a reminder that the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x is 1 over x. This is what we, one of the, our main results so far. So let's use, let's use this fact plus a formula from, that we learned in Calc 1. What formula are we going to need to use from Calc 1 to do this? If you don't see it, the hint is this is a composition of functions. The outside function is log of x. The inside function is 3x. So how do we, what rule do we use? It's called the chain rule. Chain rule. The derivative uh, says you take the derivative of the outside function, the derivative of ln is 1 over, but you leave the inside function alone. So it's 1 over 3x, not 1 over x, 1 over 3x. Then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of 3x is 3. So this is saying that the derivative is 1 over x, the log of 3. How is this possible? How is it possible for us? How is this possible? How can this be? How can this be true? Why am I harping on that? Because look, we know that the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x is 1 over x. But we just figured out that the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of 3x is also 1 over x. How can two functions have this, two different functions have the same derivative? Is it possible for the same to, for two functions? Is it possible for two functions, different functions, to have the same derivative? Of course it is. What's the derivative with respect to x of x squared plus 5? That's 2x. What's the derivative with respect to x of x squared plus 1? It's still 2x. Okay, well, so 
let's think about the answer to my question earlier. Is how is it possible for the derivatives of two function, two different functions, to have the same derivative? Well, the functions are just shifted up and down. Of uh, sorry, There's, the functions are just translated vertically from one another. Remember, the derivative of a function doesn't tell you anything about y values. It tells you about slope. So the, the derivative of x squared plus 5 and the derivative of x squared plus 1, those two functions are still are just translated, are translation, vertical translations of one another. The slopes are exactly the same. So how can the log of 3x just be a vertical translation of log of x? Well, look at the log of 3x and use the first of the three properties. This is the logarithm of 3 plus the logarithm of x. What does that logarithm of 3 represent? It's a shift up. Shift up by ln, uh, by ln 3. If you don't see it, if you still don't see this, here's the natural logarithm function y equals ln x. Now shift that up by ln 3. So here is the graph of y equals ln 3 plus ln x. The slopes of these curves are exactly the same. Look at the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1. But for log of x, look at the slope of the tangent line at, for the same function shifted up by log of 3, the slopes are the same. Same slopes. Slopes are derivatives. Same slopes. They both have a slope of 1 over x. Okay, So it's okay. So it's okay. Uh, the functions look different. They have the same derivative. That means they're just vertical translations of one another. Okay, so let's move forward with another example. Another example, part B. How about y equals um, the natural log of sine of x? Yeah, the same deal. Derivative of natural log is 1 over. But the chain rule says you take the derivative of the outside function, but you leave the inside function alone. You don't, you, so the derivative of ln is 1 over. Uh, 1 over the inside function left alone, and the by the chain rule, the derivative of the inside, derivative of sine is cosine. This is cosine over sine of x, and that's cotangent. So the derivative of the logarithm of sine of x is cotangent of x. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at another one. C. What if we take the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of x. Now that function is going to be very strange. The logarithm of x, the inside function, grows very slowly. And then we're taking the logarithm of that. The outside function and the inside function grow extremely slowly. So you've got something inside that's growing really, really, really slowly. It takes huge values of x to make the inside function even remotely large. If you take the log of that, it, it, the, the log of that number is correspondingly gets smaller and smaller. The more you take logarithms, the smaller something you get, the smaller things you get. So this function grows, becomes infinite as x goes to infinity, but in, in, incomprehensibly slowly. It takes enormous x values. To make, to make this function go to infinity. So if you want a function that goes even slower, take another logarithm. So you can get some really mind-bogglingly slow-growing functions by, by just continually taking logarithms. So let's do some calculus. The derivative, the outside function is logarithm, so the derivative of the outside function is 1 over, 1 over what? 1 over the inside function. If that's not clear, I'll try to I'll try to highlight the inside function and maybe change it to green. And where did it end up in my derivative? I'm not done with the derivative. I'm just trying to make something a little easier for us here. Let's see. There it is. So the derivative 
of lateral the natural outside function is one over one over the one over the inside function left alone times the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of log of x is one over x. So the derivative of this function is one over x times the natural log of x. Okay, this is purely algebraic manipulation. It's just simple stuff like we did in Calc 1, but now we have a natural logarithm to work with. I want to look at, for part d, something that's going to fill in the, the last shading of that, that hole in the Swiss cheese. Let's see, I want the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x. Derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x. Okay. Well, that means we have to remember what the natural log the, the absolute value looks like. The absolute value, I'm real sure you you remember this, is if I had to say what letter of the alphabet it looks like, you would tell me it looks like the looks like a V. The absolute value of x is equal to x or x greater than 0 or equal to 0. And the absolute value of x is equal to the opposite of x if x is less than 0. Okay. In fact, that's how we state this algebraically. The absolute value of x is a piecewise function. It's x, or it's the opposite of x. It's x if x is, is greater than or equal to 0. It's the opposite of x if x is less than 0. So let's, um, let's write a function. Uh, natural. Let's write a, an algebraic expression for the natural log of the absolute value of x. How do we do that? Well, we just use the, use the piecewise definition of the natural uh, of the absolute value function. So this becomes the oops. Let's see. I get my ink to work again here. It's equal to we'll take take the natural logarithm of the piecewise function it's the natural log of x or it's the natural log of the opposite of x depending on whether x is positive or x is negative if x is negative the log of absolute value of x is log of negative x if x is positive this is where some little something strange happens we lose the equal to if x is greater than zero not equal to zero we get the log of absolute value of x is is log of x we lose equals we lose we lose the equals part of greater than or equal to in this definition because the, you can't take the logarithm of zero. Remember, the definition of the logarithm requires that we're, we're taking the logarithms of positive things. So you might be thinking, well, what about right here? How about log of negative x? How can that be, that quantity, negative x, be positive? Well, it is positive. Because what's x itself? x itself is negative. This is x is negative. If x is negative, the opposite of x is positive. And things are okay. Okay, so onward. I want the derivative of this function. So take the derivative. Take the derivative of each piece. The derivative of the logarithm of x is 1 over x. So the derivative is 1 over x if x is positive. Now what's the derivative of the log of negative x? Use the chain rule. It's 1 over negative x times the derivative of the inside, negative 1. Oops, and that's for x less than 0. Simplify this. So this is 1 over x for x greater than 0. But what's 1 over negative x times negative 1? It's 1 over x again. Can you think of an easier way to write this derivative? The derivative is 1 over x if x is positive, and it's 1 over x if x is negative. So it's simply 1 over x. For x not equal to what? One, one number, 0. What we just did in this sort of complicated example 
is we filled in this with cheese holes, the biggest one. The derivative is 1 over x. The function was log of absolute value of x. The function was log of absolute value of x. The derivative is 1 over x. Put it together. In one statement, the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x is 1 over x. Okay, that's important. So, how does the how is the Swiss cheese filled in? Of course, this is for x not zero. Write this formula in integral form. So this is extremely important now. The, if the derivative of log log of x, oh, I'm sorry, I left off the absolute value. Sorry. Here, the, if the derivative of the log of the absolute value of x is one over x. Then the antiderivative, the most general antiderivative of 1 over x, is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus a constant. This is arguably one of the most important things in our whole course. This fills in the rest of that big Swiss cheese hole. The integral of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. So, the integral of x to the n with respect to x is, we can, we can make a bold statement now, it's one of two things. It's x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant, as long as n is not equal to negative 1. That's what you learned in Calc 1. It's the natural log of the absolute value of x plus a constant or n equals negative 1. That's filling in a really big gap. I'll get away from this with cheese now. A really big gap in your calculus. It's one of the biggest gaps. Okay, so let's, um, let's take a look at our the, the other thing we do a lot of in calculus. Let's integrate. So evaluate each integral. Evaluate each integral. Let's say, let's fill in another Swiss cheese hole. Uh, there I go again with the Swiss cheese. Let's, let's fill, fill in another gap. You couldn't possibly in Calc 1 at Cerritos College find the antiderivative of, of the tangent function in, in Calc 1. Okay. And here's the reason. <clears throat> the integral of tangent is the same thing as the integral of sine of x over cosine of x. That's from trig. You should know that. Now, I want to evaluate this integral by making a u substitution. So I'm going to let I'm going to let u equal cosine here, cosine of x. Now, if u equals cosine du, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And this is good news for us because this says that negative du is sine of x dx, and let's make the sub mix it, let's make this u substitution. Sine of x dx is negative du, and cosine of x is u. Let's get that negative out of there. So this is the integral of 1 over negative the integral from, of 1 over u du and we just finished looking at the integral of 1 over x with respect to x is log of absolute value of x plus c so this is negative the natural log of the absolute value of u plus a constant but u is the cosine function that, filled, that just filled in another gap 
in your calculus from Calc 1. The integral of tangent is negative log of cosine of x. Now this integral is going to come back in another section. In fact, um, in, when we get to that section, it's a good idea for you to memorize this integral. And very often the integral is given in, different, in a different form. So I'm going to use some algebra. And remember the, the negative 1 as a coefficient can be brought up into the exponent. Remember, if we don't see a, if we don't see a negative, we assume that there is a coefficient. If, if we don't see a negative 1, how do I want to say that? If we, don't, if we see negative as a coefficient, it really means negative 1 is the coefficient. Slip that in in red. And we know that coefficients become exponents with logarithms. Now, I want you to think, this is very important. It's always important that you think, but it's important that you think about what cosine of x to the negative 1 is. What's 1 over cosine of x? Very important that you know that. It is secant. And this is a very, very common form for us to have this integral written. The integral of tangent of x is the natural log of the absolute value of secant plus a constant. Okay, so we're doing a lot of stuff now that we weren't able to do in Calc 1. That's a, that's a big theme in this course. Let's look at a definite integral. Let's look at the integral from, let's say, 3 to 5 of 1 over x minus 2 with respect to x. Okay, so this is a definite integral now. Okay, so let's um let's let's evaluate this integral by making a u substitution. Okay, we know that the antiderivative of one over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x, but we're not we don't have one over x here. We have one over x minus two. So I'm going to try letting u equal x minus two. If I do, then du equals derivative of x is one, so du equals dx. But we're not looking at an indefinite integral. The, the, the integral is definite now. So what we want to do is we want to um, switch the limits of integration also. So if x equals the lower limit, 3, then u equals x minus 2. 3 minus 2 is 1. The upper limit, if x equals 5 in the upper limit, then u equals 5 minus 2 which is 3 so let's make this let's make the substitution into the integral so if we make the substitution this becomes 1 over x minus 2 is u dx is du the limits of integration transform from 3 to 5 into 1 to 3 and we're essentially home free here the integral of 1 over u the antiderivative 1 over u is the natural log of the absolute value of u. Don't ever forget the absolute values on this antiderivative from 1 to 3. Using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we substitute the upper limit of integration, and we substitute the lower limit of integration, and we subtract. Is that as far as we can go? No. We don't need absolute values for one thing. So we can write this as the natural log of 3, and what's the natural log of 1? It's 0. So the natural log of 1 is 0. So this integral has a value of the natural logarithm of 3. Let's take a look at another one. Suppose we want to find the most general antiderivative. So we're looking at an indefinite integral of, let's say, x over x squared plus 1 with respect to x. Okay. Well, it looks completely foreign now, but, but all we need is the only technique we ever learn in Calc 1, plus our integral for today, the integral of 1 over x equals the natural log of the absolute value of x plus a constant. So let's make a u substitution here. Let's try to transform this into the logarithm integral. So let's like let's let u equal x squared plus one. So then du 
equals 2x dx. So x dx equals 1 half du. And now we can transform the integral from x's to u's. x dx is 1 half du. And I'm substituting x squared plus 1 for u. My u's turn look like w sometimes. Real often, actually. So let's factor out the 1 half. This is the integral. 1 half times the integral of 1 over u du. I'm almost there. The antiderivative of 1 over u is the natural log of the absolute value of u plus constant. So this is 1 half times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus 1 plus constant. Okay, so we're able to do a bunch of integrals that we were not even close to being able to handle in Calc 1. I want to ask you before we move on to our next example, can I do anything with this example? Can I distribute the logarithm? No. It's common. That's a very common mistake for students to distribute logarithms into addition. It doesn't work. But I can do one thing. I can't distribute the ln inside. I can actually do a couple things. I could bring the one half into the exponent, but I'm, I don't want to do that. What I can do, and what you should try to do, is to determine whether you really need to have those absolute values on your answer. You don't in this case. x squared plus 1 is always positive for, for, for every real value of x. So we don't need the absolute values on. Now, if you ever forget and leave the absolute values on on your exams, I don't take off for that. And I've informed my grader not to take off for that either. <laughs> so, But you should try to get used to uh, being efficient. So if, if absolute values are not necessary, get rid of them. Some instructors will take off points for that sort of thing. So you ought, ought to get used to being real precise. OK. Let's take a look at another thing we've done and did in Calculus 1. So for example, I want to differentiate. I want to go back to derivatives. I want to find y prime if the natural log of xy equals y times the sine of x. Now, as soon as I write something like this, something should come to mind. If it doesn't immediately, it should come to mind in not too long. What do we need to do to take the derivative here? We can't solve for y is your hint. I think you probably thought of it. If not, uh, implicit differentiation is the is the way to go here. We cannot possibly solve for y, so we need to use implicit differentiation. We can do one thing though before we start. We can we can that log of x y can be written as log of x plus log of y by using the first of the three big principles that we looked at. Then we can take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. I can take the derivative with respect to x of log of x plus log of y. I can, oops. I can take the derivative with respect to x of uh, y sine x. All I'm doing for this step is just inserting the differentiation operation. Then differentiate. The derivative of log of x is 1 over x. Now you have to think about y as a function, not of just a single variable, but a function. So we need to use the chain rule on this, or uh, the rule we learned for implicit differentiation for log of y. The derivative of log of y is 1 over y. That's the derivative of the outside function. Leave the inside function y alone. Take times the derivative of the inside function. Well, the derivative of the inside function is y prime. Okay. Then for the right-hand side, we can't just factor out that sine of x or, dis or distribute the logarithm in here, uh, the differentiation in here. So we need to use the product rule. The product rule says the derivative of the product y times sine of x is the derivative of the first, y prime, times the second, plus the first one left alone, y times the derivative of sine, which is cosine x. So now we got a mess. We, got a, we have a, a, an, an equation 
that has our goal uh, on, of y prime on both sides. So we need to solve for y. This is where all the algebra happens. So let's let's keep everything with a y prime on one side, or get everything with a y prime on one side. So I'm going to bring the I'm going to bring the y prime sine x to the uh, to the left hand side. And let's take everything that doesn't have a y prime on it to the right hand side. So what I'm going to get is on the right hand side I already had the y cosine x. I'm going to subtract 1 over x from both sides. We're almost there, believe it or not. So y prime times 1 over y minus sine of x, factoring out the y prime equals y cosine x minus 1 over x. And finally, uh, almost finally, I guess, we can divide both sides by whatever's keeping y prime from being alone. We'll divide both sides by, by the coefficient of y prime, which is that whole 1 over y minus sine of x. Yeah, that's pretty much it. We I'd like to have our answer not as a complex fraction, so maybe I'll I'll multiply the numerator and denominator by x times y. That'll do it. So if I multiply numerator and denominator by x y, I'm going to get uh, y prime equals x y squared cosine x minus y, because if I multiply x y times 1 over x, the x cancels. Then in the denominator, I'm going to get x, 1 over y times x y is x, minus x y sine x. And that does it. Finally, the last thing I want to do in this section is I want to talk about something brand new that's really kind of wonderful. It's called logarithmic differentiation. Logarithmic differentiation. Don't panic. Its, it's name is, sounds really, really, really complicated. But it's uh, a fancy name for something that, that makes some differentiation that you did in Calc 1 that was very difficult makes it really, really, really easy. Let me dig in. Here's our final example. So for our final example for this for this section, uh, find y prime. Find y prime if y is given by this rational function. Remember, rational functions are sort of uh, fractional functions. They're in fact sometimes they're called fractional functions. Uh, they're uh, fra uh, functions that are the quotients of polynomials, quotients of power functions. Okay. Sorry about that little glitch. So let's take the derivative of this function. You might be thinking, oh my god, what a nightmare. I'm going to have to use the product rule and the quotient within the within the quotient rule, this is going to be a mess. Logarithmic differentiation works like this. For, ra for rational functions, we can, instead of taking the, the derivative right away, we can take the natural logarithm of the function. We can take the natural logarithm of both sides. Now take a look at what happens when I do that. Take a look at what happens when I take the natural log of both sides. Okay, this looks like I'm making things more complicated than they were to begin with, but it's not. If I take the natural logarithm of this quotient, this, this quotient of two functions, the, the quotient of x plus 1 to the fourth times x squared over x minus 5 fifths, I can use the second property to write this as the logarithm of the top minus the logarithm of the bottom. Now we all of a sudden don't have any fraction anymore. But there's more. I can take the 
the first term, which is the logarithm of the product, and use the first property that turns the products into sums of logarithms. Logarithm of a product turns into sum of logarithms. It was log of x plus 1 to the fourth plus log of x squared minus the natural log of x minus 3 to the fifth. And I can do one more thing. The logarithm, the, the fourth, the third property turns all those coefficients. I haven't done any calculus yet. Turns all those coefficients, I'm sorry, all those exponents into coefficients. Two comes down, the four comes down, the two comes down, the five comes down. Now take the logarithm. I'm sorry, now take the derivative of both sides. So the logarithm of y equals this now expanded uh, expression with a whole bunch of logarithms and take the derivative of both sides. Use the implicit differentiation on the left. The derivative of log of y is 1 over y times what? Times the derivative of the inside times y prime. Now the derivative of 4 times log of x plus 1 is 4. Constants uh, don't have the constants can be factored out of differentiation. So the derivative of log of x plus 1 is 1 over x plus 1. Then by the chain rule, the derivative of x plus 1 is 1. 2 times the derivative of logarithm. Drug of, derivative of log of x is 1 over x. Minus 5 times the derivative of, of log of x minus 3 is 1 over x minus 3. Then by the chain rule, derivative of the inside, derivative of x minus 3 is 1. Finally, y prime, if you multiply both sides by y, is y times 4 over x plus 1 plus 2 over x minus 5 over x minus 3, which is perfectly fine, even though it has a, our derivative has a y in it. It's okay to have y's in our derivatives. Or you can substitute the original y back in and have everything in terms of x. It doesn't matter to me on your exam or your homework you can leave leave the answer just as I just wrote with the y leading the leading the pack leading the the coefficient or you could substitute the x value back in or the y value back in makes no difference no difference to me but it sure as heck makes a difference this logarithmic differentiation and how much work we'd have to do with the product rule, chain rules, product rules, chain rule, quotient rules uh, that would be involved in this derivative had we not used logarithms first. So the, 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 the upshot of all this, logarithm, logarithmic differentiation is good when you have quotients and you, that you want derivatives of. You take the logarithm of both sides of the function and use the first three properties of logarithms to expand the lot the the expression out of out of uh, quotients and products so you just have sums and differences of simple expressions then take the log the derivatives of both sides so um, here's our derivative and that ends this section we have just completed section 6.2 star feel free to dig into homework whenever you can and I am looking forward to talking with you again soon.